I was listening to the BBC, I mean BBC, last night, and they had a really weird story about a woman who was born with testicles. I think they were inside of her bodies. I think the condition is called testicular feminization. And this woman was in her 50s, and she was telling her story about how when she was in a hospital um, getting a procedure done in her mid-50s, she looked at the chart, her chart, and on the chart, which I guess most patients don't take the time to read, in red letters, it was scrawled testicular feminization. She got the doctor in and said, hey, what's up with the, what is that? Doctor said, I can't tell you. You have to ask your family physician. Well, she'd been having problems, physical and mental problems her whole life. So she went to the doctor she'd been seeing for 25 years. She walked into the room and said, what, what, what is this? So apparently the doctor gave her some literature, told her to go into a room and read about it. And all of a sudden, everything in her life made sense. But these doctors, but according to what she was saying on the BBC last night, the doctors decided sometime in 1995, they pretty much decided they were going to stop telling women who were born with this condition. For whatever reason, they just said that, you know, whatever crazy reason, that's what they said they were going to do. So all these women had these crazy things going on inside of them. The doctors knew, everybody knew, except the person it was happening to. They kind of, a lot of them thought they were crazy or this or that. I mean, you can imagine the kind of changes you're going through if you're a woman. I can, uh, you know, I can't imagine it, but if you have inner test testicles instead of ovaries. And nobody will tell you. Well, you see where I'm going with this. I mean, how many, to- how many, how many societies, how many group professional groups are out there? One of their main functions is to tell people, pr- reporters, thinking of the Society of Professional Journalists and the National Association of Black Journalists. One of their big functions is they tell people how to report on black crime and black life in general. So they're always, you know, they're always encouraging their members to do stories about black institutions, black colleges, black churches, black funeral homes, black music, black newspapers, black TV, the very long list. But when it comes time to, when it come and, and when you do, do those stories, it, you know, whatever the story is, the backstory is always the same. There's an enormous amount of white racism that's held black people down. They had to create their own institutions and look how they blossomed, despite all the hardships of white racism. But when it comes to black crime and black criminality so wildly out of proportion, the same reporters who are creating this enormous paradigm of racial consciousness will look at you and go, what, crime? We're we're colorblind on crime. Race doesn't have anything to do with crime. And just like the story of the woman who had all these crazy things happening to her physically and mentally because she didn't know what was happening to her, there are lots and lots of consequences of reporters and public officials and activists and liberals trying to tell us something is not happening when it really is happening, as it is with the greatest lie of our generation, the myth of black victimization. I was thinking that when I saw this recent story out of St. Louis. A couple of girls, young ladies, they go to a concert downtown St. Louis all of a sudden, they're wandering around downtown St. Louis looking for their car. They cannot find it. Let's pick up the story and see what happens. After a concert at the Scott Trade Center, instead, they were beat up and had their car stolen. Only on News 4, they're sharing their story with Alexa Zotos in hopes of warning others. Well, Eric, it happened Thursday night after the Chainsmokers concert at Scott Trade Center downtown. The two women got lost looking for their car, and the group that helped them ended up stealing their car. This is the only photo from the Chainsmokers concert these two friends now have. Their phones, wallets, and sense of security all stolen in downtown. It was really scary at first, and now we're starting to move past it, but we really don't trust people as much. The two women from Alton were trying to find their car after the show at Scott Trade Center. We had been walking around for like an hour, an hour and a half, and we were stopped at like Bush Stadium. That's when a group of guys ages 8 years old to 20 came up and said they could help. They just started following us at that point. When they got back to their car in the Kiel garage, that's when it went downhill. So I was in the driver's seat and one of them got my attention because he said that it looked like I had a scratch on my door. That's when one of the suspects jumped in the car. Instead of giving it to them, the girls fought back. And I was trying to get him out. So while I was trying to get him out, he like punched me to get me off of him. She said one of them did have a gun and the group took off in the car. The next day, police recovered it, but everything inside was gone. They took 
a car seat, a stroller. They took my daughter's medication. They took a CD out of the CD player. They took money. Looking back, they realized just how lucky they were. At this point, I'm just thankful to like be alive and I don't know, stuff's replaceable. How many stories have we done on St. Louis? How many could we do? We've got some great correspondents in St. Louis. I'm thinking of Catfish Jenkins, and I'm thinking of a guy named Larry. You can find Catfish in the comments section. You can find Larry. Um, he, he writes me a lot of emails about St. Louis. I'm waiting for somebody to do a St. Louis page. So much uh, black violence, and there's so much denial, deceit, and delusion in St. Louis. And the consequences are, in this case, these, these young women... They're roaming around downtown St. Louis as if they don't have a care in the world, as if there's nothing happening, as if the only way they've only received any information about St. Louis is from the local TV reporter who's and the reporters in St. Louis. I mean, they know their town is hanging on by a thread. And a lot of people think that thread snapped a long time ago and the city is dead. And so St. Louis, you know, I'm thinking of one story where like a large group of black people rampaged through downtown. You know, destroying property, defying police, attacking people on video, and then the you know then the reporter, this 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 female reporter, I think she was probably about 40, 45 years old. She does a story the next day. She's kind of in front of a restaurant where you know people are outside eating a salad and drinking white wine, and she's describing how much how great downtown is, how much people, how much fun people are having there. And by the way, last night a whole bunch of black people rampaged through our town. But other than that, this is fan, a fantastic place. So come on down. So many episodes of black mob violence and black on white crime in St. Louis, and many episodes connected to their sports stadiums. Thinking of the guy who who's in a wheelchair today because he went to a Cardinal game and going back to his car, boom! Somebody shot him and and, and paralyzed him. A black person did that. These these stories are just they're numerous in St. Louis, and there's they're kind of no surprise to people in St. Louis who keep their eyes open. But they might be a surprise to young ladies who go to college and their mommy and daddy are trying to shelter them from the big bad world out there. And they didn't say, listen, if you go to St. Louis, don't be stupid. Don't walk around downtown St. Louis and don't talk to strangers. Because black on white crime is a big problem in St. Louis and white people downtown St. Louis are targets. That is a plain fact. How many times do we have to show that? Why don't we move on up to Chicago for the same kind of story, except worse by like a hundred times. So the story we're about to see, anybody who's read White Girl Bleed a lot is going to recognize the main anchor here. His name's Ravi. He's the guy I sent some email to. We had an email exchange every every time I was trying to de-escalate. And he was getting angrier and angrier, accusing me of being a worse and worse person because I was documenting all this black criminality in Chicago. And I was also documenting how his station was leading the way and ignoring, denying, condoning, excusing, encouraging, and even lying about it. So whenever I see a story like this out of their station, I have a mental stopwatch I put on. Boom. My stopwatch clicked at about 15 seconds before the reporter on the story told their very first lie. Warning about brazen armed attacks targeting people on the streets of Lincoln Park. In each of those attacks, a group of thieves have threatened to shoot the victims mm. if the victims did not follow orders. There have been six armed robberies, all taking place on Monday and Tuesday. And Eyewitness News reporter John Garcia is live with the investigation. John. Ravi, police have been unable to get very detailed descriptions of these suspects. They appear to be four young men between the ages of 17 and 20 years old, armed with a handgun. These attacks have all happened between 10 and 11 o'clock at night, all in the heart of Lincoln Park. Noelle Daniels gets security alerts from DePaul's public safety office on her phone. The senior theater major says she's concerned about walking around campus at night after six armed robberies this week in the neighborhood. When I was looking to go to DePaul, I wasn't expecting um, all of these things to be happening, especially the armed robberies that have been happening. The six armed robberies since Monday evening have all happened in a several block radius in Lincoln Park on or near the DePaul campus. They've posted the Chicago police alert about the robberies in buildings around the campus, and most students are aware. Public safety did a really good job of um, kind of responding as fast as they could in terms of filing the report and making sure that everyone um, knew what was going on on campus or near campus. You are in school in Chicago. It is an urban campus. 
it's an open campus, so it isn't only the Paul students on our campus. So we just have to be smarter about how we're training students to adapt to this type of environment. 43rd Ward Alderman Michelle Smith has also sent alerts to neighborhood residents. She says CPD has increased patrols and will keep up intense surveillance throughout the holiday weekend. We urge everyone to be vigilant and report anything suspicious immediately to 911. I'm always cognizant of my environment and my surroundings, so it's nothing I'm too afraid from. Police say in at least one of the robberies, the suspect appeared to leave the area in a silver car. Now, police say they plan to increase surveillance in the area, but also they will have bike patrols, particularly concentrating on the area of Oz Park. Did you catch it? Did you catch the lie? Did you catch the reporter looking right in the camera and telling us he didn't have a detailed description? Well, that's... that's that's the new slang from the Society of Professional Journalists and National Association of Black Journalists, of course. That's the new way of saying black people committed this crime, but we're not going to talk about that because if we identified all the criminals by race, this would be one long channel of black criminality, one story after another. So he looked in the camera and he told us, didn't have a detailed description. So I was going to call my friends up in the Chicago Police Department. I hadn't planned to do this, but... The guys in Chicago, they send me a lot of stuff. I like my shirt. Get a lot of calls from Chicago cops. Chicago cops, they feel like they're kind of at the end of their rope as far as like telling people in Chicago what's going on in their town and how so much bad stuff's happening, but people don't realize it. And so, you know, when you have people, uh, and we have black people, oh, by the way, so I was going to call them up and say, hey, God, could you tell me like, even though I kind of, my investigative hypothesis is that, yes, the people were holding people up, putting guns in the faces of students at DePaul were black. Uh, you know, we don't do this channel based on my hunches. We do this channel based on facts. So I, call, I was going to call them up and say, hey, well, could you, you know, tell me who was involved in that thing, what their description is? But the station kind of saved me the trouble by flashing it up there really quickly. Did you see this part of the the, the DePaul announcement, the crime alert. Well, in the crime alerts, colleges are required by the Cleary Act to, to tell us what they know about the person committing the crime. And so they're required, if they have a description, they're not allowed to say, oh, we don't have a de detailed description. Some think they are, but they're not. Anyway, DePaul put it up there. If you looked at it, I'll, I'll, I'll put an arrow on it. You'll see four black people did it. But what about the reaction of the students? See, this, you know, DuPaul is no really, not really different than most other colleges in this country. In the classrooms, kids, the kids, black and white, are learning, that, are learning the greatest lie of our generation as if it is gospel. The greatest lie of our generation is that black people are relentless victims of white racism all the time, everywhere. That explains everything. That's it. That's what you learn in college. But it's funny how they never take this learning out of the classroom and into the streets. Or when they do, it sounds kind of silly. So they'll want, you know, the people are going, well, I don't know. I don't really expect this to happen. After all, this is Chicago. That never happens in Chicago. We've done a lot of stories on DePaul. The McDonald's near the campus, large groups of black people are, are marauding and mobbing in there and attacking people regularly. These aren't, you know, these aren't, this isn't what I heard. This is what we document in my books and here. And what about that one guy, the, the, uh, I think he was a student. He said, well, this is an urban campus, and we have to expect that. Okay, I'm going to use a term that's kind of popular now. Could you unpack that for me? What does that mean, it's an urban environment? A lot of, lot of, Orient, a lot of Asian people live in an urban environment. They're not going around putting guns in people's faces. No, they're having the guns put in their face. And to say it's an urban environment is to use academic doublespeak for saying, oh, yeah, we got a lot of black people living around here, and that's what makes it dangerous. That's what makes DePaul campus dangerous. And what makes it even more dangerous is the willingness of people at DePaul, is the willingness of people at ABC to look into the camera and pretend it's not happening. You want to do a little story on black victimization? Oh, ABC is all over it. You want to do a story, a real story about black predators victimizing the students at DePaul University with six holdups in a couple hours? 
then all of a sudden everybody's colorblind. Because they know when it comes to reporting this black violence so wildly out of proportion, they know at ABC and Chicago and all the stations, almost every station all over the country, they know it's better to live in a fairy tale. It's better to pretend it's not happening. It's better to say we don't have a detailed description. It's better to say we live in an urban environment than to tell the truth plainly about what's going on, which of course would contradict all the other little fairy tales you tell on your news channel all the time. And that is black crime is wildly out of proportion in Chicago, at DePaul, and, and everybody's in denial about it. That is the truth. Here's another truth. Saying that makes the black kids angry. <laughs> 